mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like Live right here on Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Always happy to be your host. Good morning, grand rising, all that good stuff. Uh, please do hit the like, share, subscribe, join button if you can. And of course, uh, I went back and watched some of it again this weekend. If uh, uh, members uh, do get access to that first of a series of forthcoming round tables with uh, the soldier stories of the Black Liberation Army. And um, I guess as they used to say, it's well worth the price of admission. So anyway, uh, do consider that and uh, uh, consider helping us continue to grow here at BPM, uh, a collective. And again, the point for me is I would paraphrase or summarize the, 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 the goal of BPM is to create a new public sphere that is in the traditional sense of communication studies of the space where people gather to engage in the politics of the day. Uh, the point being to bring people into a community to gather, to have those discussions and conversations, even debates uh, that will propel and advance revolutionary struggle and organization. Uh, so anyway, so that's that's really the 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 goal that we're trying to do that as, as I see it that we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, and from my perspective, there are any number of brilliant individuals and even small collectives uh, operating uh, in the world and in the media environment that continues to expand infinitely. Uh, but I'm, I, but uh, from my point of view, I don't think that they cover the uh, range of politics that we attempt here. Uh, and with the specific goals of uh, collective building, of organization building. Uh, so anyway, so uh, for those joining me this morning, I appreciate it. Uh, just trying to, again, hold it down and preserve this space, uh, which, again, selfishly works perfectly for me uh, for the Remix Morning Show, which will be back tomorrow for our BPM Monday on Tuesday <laughs> with the full crew. Uh, in, in any moment, I'm expecting uh, Dr. Kwesi Conadu to join me. Uh, he contacted me after seeing, and in fact, he's just popping in now. Um, but uh, uh, I almost want to—I almost want to invite him to hold on a second because there's one thing I did want to get to that I, I almost don't feel like sullying his his great reputation and name uh, with my my silliness. Uh, but, but, uh, Dr. Kwesi Kornadu is going to join us in a few minutes to, to talk about, and I hope, can, I think he's going to hopefully stay the whole duration. I'm not sure exactly. I can't, or I can't remember what he told me about his schedule. We'll see in a minute. Um, but I thought it was dope because he contacted me after seeing the segment I did last week using his more recently published piece, piece on reparations throughout the continent of Africa to talk about. Uh, an extended conversation I had with Dr. Barbara Ransby. Um, and he contacted me because it was, and I remember there was one point in the piece where I, I remember I got to it and I remember reading it and thinking, well, we might disagree on this one. 
And then he contacted me and used that as an example to talk about what he wanted to talk about in terms of the construction of the piece and what ended up being the published version and something that I think is very important for us to consider uh, as so much of us do obviously engage journalism and digital media uh, and read things from people we may know or not that may or may not reflect entirely the version they were attempting to convey initially. So I think this is going to be a great conversation. And then in the second hour, uh, and in fact, I'll, I'll rely on the folks in the chat. I, sh I didn't have time to actually check on this, um, frankly. And uh, uh, so I'll ask folks to, to catch me on this and help me out here. But in the next hour, we're going to be joined for a discussion of the Keith Davis Jr. case, uh, by, of course, Erica Keynes. People obviously know her, her very well around here and uh, someone whose name I'm about to struggle with. So I'm going to ask, this is what I'm asking for help for. Uh, is it Bilfina Yawon? Uh, she'll be joining us uh, to talk about her uh, writing and uh, abolitionist and restorative practice practitioner work, but also specifically her work around um, the Keith Davis Jr. case. So, uh, anyway, um, the one, but before we get to it, there were a couple of things that, that I did want to get to this morning. And one in particular, I'm going to, I just want to run through before I invite Dr. Connor do up here. Cause, cause I, cause I don't want to, <laughs> again, I don't want to sully this brilliant brother's name. I want to make sure there's a clear distinction because he doesn't know, he doesn't know this is going to happen. So, and I don't know if he's seen this and I, and I don't even know what he would think about it, but I just want to make sure that, that there's a clear distinction that, you know, the, the views and what, the, what is it? The views and perspectives of those blah, 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 blah. So that when people watch this, they know that, that this is not, he is not co-signing, you know, and we have every opportunity to separate this, but this is something. So, so check this out. So a couple of days ago, um, uh, I was I was shared this tweet uh, from Karik Salil Chapman uh, described here as the faculty and staff of a magical HBCU. All right. And it's pretty interesting. So it's obviously people faces you're going to recognize. And, and 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 he just went through and labeled who who these people would be in this again, magical HBCU. So this is the dean of students strictly uh, strict but fair. Uh, shady, mysterious past, impeccable suit game. Uh, Blair Underwood teaches pharmaceutical alchemy, much older than he looks, smiles inappropriately at female students. That's deep. Uh, never goes anywhere without his 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 hip flask of unknown potion. Sam Jackson, Hexology 101, regularly threatens and cusses at students, jinxed his TA several times. I don't care. I have tenure. Uh... Uh, 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 um, uh, is this LeVar Burton, right? Uh, university librarian knows every book, uh, knows where every book is, very patient, memorizes every student's name. Uh, Angela Bassett teaches principles of magical law, 21st century, object of every male freshman's desire, fashion icon, stopping them old enough to be your grandmother. This is my guy right here, Keith David. This is, this is one of my favorite actors of all time. Uh, uh, been in a lot of bad movies, but I just like them. Uh, teaches modern demonology and exorcism strategy on the dean's lives, gives life threat life threatening homework. You don't know Jack about fighting demons. Uh, Morgan Freeman, who is one of my least favorite popular figures in the world, uh, because pri primarily because of his on screen CNN discussion with Don Lemon of a few years ago, saying that black people have no right to complain. Uh, racism is not an, an issue, so on and so forth. Anyway, but university presidents hate slack, hate president hates slackers and freshmen, stares disapprovingly, drives a flying Cadillac. And did, did I hear correctly that Denzel's name it was really Denzel? It's really supposed to be pronounced Denzel? Anyway, teaches theory of linguistic spellcraft 102, knows 30 languages and written uh, uh, grim grimoires. In 17, I don't know what that is. Grimoires, uh, popular among female staff. Uh, older people will let you retake his tests. Uh, honestly, I don't know who this sister's name is. Forgive me for not knowing who this sister's name is. Uh, apologies. Teaches interplan interplaner planner planner interplanner communication. Is three thousand years old. Got Cherokee in her. <laughs> That's messed up. Uh, runs financial aid. Oh, that's messed up. It's always on break. Acts confused a lot. <laughs> 
campus psychiatrist, prescribes crystals. All right, my man, custodian, grumpy, rude, wise, and chance. All right, teaches black magic, ritual, and religion, is very opinionated and critical of Christianity. <laughs> teaches advanced transmutation, fabulous, often late for class. Uh, teaches astral projection and dream walking. Uh, and then finally, teaches experimental spellcraft studio, scares male students, argues <laughs> with our shadow, argues back. Okay. So that was, so then when I saw this, I said, okay, oh, there's a part two. I didn't even get to the part two. My bad. Okay. So, so I'll just stop there for that one. Because when I saw it, I said, well, well, I couldn't even help it. I said, we need a, uh, that's the magical HBCU. But what if, what if there was one for the, for, for an actual HBCU? So so mine is starting with, 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 again, good Sam, a former acting star who hates teaching and his students and is only there because he can't find regular work in Hollywood, hates that he is at an HBCU and not at least at NYC film school, cusses at his students and colleagues and cares nothing about tenure. Uh, this brother is a wasted genius librarian presiding over a dwindling array of research database budget cuts cares little because no one does real research there anyway. So he knows the library is, cer cer is cer library is ceremonial and is bothered to be bothered. Head of a previously non-existent program funded sufficiently by wall street. So as to obscure a total lack of academic production, all the students love her because their interaction is always superficial and never involves a grade or accountability. I had to do my man, Keith, Wright. Uh, the last radical of a bygone era who hasn't published much or in popular outlets, happy to be near retirement, having fought the good, a good but losing fight and will not be replaced. University president, hyper proud of his fundraising ability and having been invited to Trump's White House, wants to move the HBCU beyond being a black university and loves neocolonialism. Choir director, always smiling because the world loves and pays well for HBCUs depicted exclusively for their for their step shows, marching bands, and Negro spirituals. New hire, genius, hyper-motivated, loves Black people, teaches them well, and is just everything. Soon to be hired by a PWI, predominantly white institution, who will pay her twice as much to teach half the classes, allowing her to be even more valuable to a smaller group of Black students there. The previous sister, but 20 years later and absent any move to that PWI, she will write her one meaningful publication after retirement. Her student evals now largely contain complaints about her temperament and low energy. The upper level administrative hire, her smile, friendly demeanor and constant biblical references are performative veneers meant to deflect criticism of her bosses. Head of political silence, science, proudly from wherever black Americans are not wishes he was at Oxford or the London school of economics from the black community where her HBCU is located fiercely loyal to her community university, great grant writer, most radical acts voting for Obama, Hillary Clinton, and then Biden admin office manager hired to intimidate faculty, not to make requests for even one single thing trying to start her HBCU's first black studies program, writes books on race and for major newspapers, which upsets admin who invariably ignores and suppresses her work so as to not pu be publicly associated with it. And then finally, teaches film and ethnomusicology, is well-liked and famous, presents revolution as an aesthetic and is promoted and well-paid for precisely this level of emptiness. All right. Anyway, so I just want to have a little fun with that thread of what it would be like to be at a uh, uh, not a magical, but uh, a, a real HBCU. So there it is. All right. Without further ado, now let's we'll, we'll take the 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 proverbial uh, uh, deep breath, pause, break, create that uh, psychic or intellectual space and gap between that bit of uh, sarcastic ironic in the true meaning of the word irony not alanis morissette's battered and bruised beaten and dragged uh uh <laughs> redefining a term 
Um, but anyway, what we're going to get, let me, let me bring him up here now, Dr. Kwesi Carnadu, uh, to, to return to talk with us about reparations, African diaspora, and the pitfalls of editors and publishers. Dr. Carnadu, among many other things, is, is John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Endowed Chair and Professor at Colgate University, where he teaches courses in African history and on worldwide African histories and cultures. He is the founder of uh, Africa Diaspora Press and has published widely on any number of issues. The, the brother is a uh, nonstop, uh, uh, I don't even, you know, tour de force. Anyway, it's a pleasure to have you back, Brother Connor. Do welcome. Good morning. Thanks for joining me. Good to see you again. Greetings. We appreciate it. So as I said in the in the in the setup, uh, I, I really appreciated the the call you you gave me last week. Where and, and basically you, you know you said, look, I, I saw the piece you did. You and and you know you 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 worked through the the essay I wrote on uh, reparations. But let me put you up on to a little bit of what really went on with that. And I thought it was fascinating. I'm glad you wanted to come on and talk about it because sort of as I talk about with, on her segments with CBS, when she talks about the writing process and all this and how valuable that is. This to me is is as equally valuable to what goes on in academia, journalism, and elsewhere that we don't honestly talk very much about, certainly not publicly. So uh, I'll leave it there and let you 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 sort of start with with how you want to uh, approach it this morning. But again, welcome, and I appreciate it. Appreciate it as well, very much. So um, thank you for having me back. Um, you know, on you know the the show. So. Part of what I, I wanted to do is, um, you know, sort of have a um, obviously discussion with you and the folks who are joining you about sort of the backstory, which I think is the real story <laughs> um, of, of the published piece. And then, you know, hopefully we can get into um, really, if anything, uh, what this um, reparations um, discourse um, can mean, particularly outside of the United States. Um, and then, you know, so some of the um, not only publishing and knowledge production and other kinds of connected um, issues that, that kind of flow out of out of um, really having, you know, um, a certain kind of representation, you know, of of certain views uh, w w within a landscape you're very familiar with, which is the media landscape, right? And, and so, um, part of the the the, the backstory that folks um, would not know unless they heard it from me directly is that the piece that was published in the conversation uh, about reparations, um, I think the title was "What the U.S. Can Learn from Africa About Reparations." That that particular piece, the version that was published, was not the version that you know I had initially authored. There it is, mm -hmm. for folks to see, and. In particular, there's, there's, a, there's a set of languages that are used that anyone who knows my my, my work, who has read anything of mine, will, will, will immediately or should immediately, you know, have a flag raised to say, "Wait a second, <laughs> um, I'm very precise about the kind of language that I use, particularly when, when talking about you know peoples of African ancestry." And there is there's a certain kind of that kind of structures um, and language and even approach that. You know, just would not be me. And so, um, the backstory for me of what happened from the article that I originally wrote <laughs> to the article or version that was published, you know, I think I think is very fascinating and perhaps eye opening to folks who who do read, you know, who do digest digital and other kinds of content, who do, um, you know, look at someone that has this particular title like I do, who is associated with university. And essentially, um, you know, they're digesting uh, what they believe to be uh, a view that comes, you know, solely from me. In fact, this is a negotiated sort of truce of sorts um, between myself, the editors, and the publication. And so I just wanted to at least, um, you know, wrestle with you on, on, on you know, some of these um, tensions that happen in the background that, in fact, you know, comes out in the published version. And by the way, because um, folks like you and I, you know, have published um, not simply in mainstream, you know, media outlets, but also in academic circles, um, this process is very similar to that process as well. And so, again, there is a particular, um, you know, set of, of, of not only obstacles, but a set of uh, trappings that are part of knowledge production. 
particularly when it comes to people of African ancestry, uh, whether in white societies or other societies, um, these same trappings um, tend to be there. And so I think we need to have some, you know, discussion, interior discussion in terms of what happens really, you know, in the backstory before we get to the front page story. Mm. Uh, before we go on, do you want to work through the piece as it's published and, and show what any details about what you're talking about? Do we, In other words, do you want me to leave it up or do you want to... Is there another way you want to uh, approach, um, you know, the details or the specifics of what what went on and and what you ultimately do want to say in a piece like this? Well, we can go with what you what you have in mind. I'm, I'm pretty flexible, so I don't have any particular plan. Um, so I mean, do I don't either. I, that was I, that's why I'm on the fly on that one. I, <laughs> All right. Know, so, okay. so 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 uh, so we can start where you are right now. Okay. So what you have up right now uh, is actually perfect. So we can start there and sort of just go. Not so methodically, because we didn't need to um, bore the folks, but at least you know go through these sections to, to kind of show you how there there actually more than one voice there. There are actually a number of choices that are made, ideological choices that are made. Um, there, there are structural choices that are made. The choices that are made for the audience, perceived audience, um, that are made that that are at odds with the authors. You know audience mm, <laughs> and so mm. we, we can start in, in, in the first um the intro here so the intro here what folks would see um particularly the language here that, that i think is important to pluck out so um this piece begins with you know the house judiciary committee you know voting on april 14th not long ago about this commission um now i made it sh i made sure that i had descendants of enslaved people because initially you know they they had the editors and there were two levels of editors the editor that i worked with you know on the actual piece and there were the su supervising editors that were that were basically the clearing house right and so on the one hand you know the editor that i worked with um you know we tussled over some of these vocabulary so he had put in um slaves Mm. And, and that's a conceptual, um, you know, category that I just reject woolly <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, completely. Um, and so there was a fight even over nomenclature, right? Or, or, or over just simply enslaved people. Because, you know, for those of you um, that are, are checking us out, the difference between slave and enslaved people is this, is that slave comes from the term Slav and, and that referring to the Slavic people of largely Northern and Central Europe. And the term Slav became associated with captivity and bondage, you know, in sort of uh, medieval and post medieval Europe, precisely because these people were, were bonded people to the Germanic peoples. And so Slav became a synonym for, for slave, meaning captive bondage. And that term essentially bled into other European languages. So in Portuguese, escravos, uh, French, escrav, and, and so on, right? And so to be a slave is really to be a Slav meaning that it, the term has no genealogy, no connection to African people. However, once African peoples were essentially moving into Europe, you know, um, you know, by force, in some cases, by other routes, through the Mediterranean, you know, um, through the Portuguese and, 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 and Spain, 15th century, um, even 13th, 14th century, in fact, uh, through places like Italy, once Africans, you know, began to enter sort of the southern portion of Europe, in some appreciable numbers, they began to replace the Slavs, um, people that uh, these European peoples, you know, from around the Capsin and Black Sea region, right? Who uh, essentially um, were essentially sort of declining in terms of their presence, while Africans were increasing in terms of these, you know, um, cities. So places like Valencia in Spain, um, in, in, in the southern portions of Italy, in Lisbon, in Portugal. So once in, in England, in fact, right? In fact, Queen Elizabeth had complained about the Blackamoors, right, <laughs> being a threat <laughs> in the late 16th century. So my point is simply that once Africans began to enter Europe as bonded captive people, they began to take on the meaning of the Slav, whereas the Slav would begin to decline in terms of the white slave trade that, that authors have talked about. Um, and so, when I use and, and when scholars use the term enslaved people, we're referring to the condition of, of any people, but in this case, African peoples, that is not inherent to who they are, right? Because Slav was inherent to who these people are. And so this is why I, I detach myself conceptually from the term slave as sort of a shorthand, a lazy shorthand 
for the condition of African people. So that was a conceptual fight that was important to me. So I changed that and, and I made sure that stayed. But originally, again, it was slave. And this is simply just um, a small fraction of the, the, the larger tussle mm -hmm. you know, about, about a piece that for many of us is not, not even controversial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right on, right on. Um, you you said that there was uh, uh, also a shift in. Well, first of all, I thought it was great because the the point for me because I remember reading even when we were doing it live and there, I forgot exactly where it is in the piece uh, and we can come back uh, to whatever you want, but but um, to me the line that that should have alerted me because when you told me that there was sort of there's a there's a um, um, a thematic change. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the way you described it in the piece, as you, as, you, as 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 one reads it, but the 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 um, where was the line that there was something about the 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 something about the African Union having power? Is it isn't it? Well, uh, it was the ANC, the ANC, so ANC. That was what it was. Right. The ANC. That's if, right, if, right. If right. you can scroll back up kindly to the the South Africa uh, example. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, yeah. But that was the one. Anyway, my point is, is that that should go. have alerted right me more clearly. <laughs> there it is uh, to the to the issue you're raising here, because I was I was like, man, crazy. I was like, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah, right, it's, it's right here, my friend. So yeah. on the third passage, where it says South Africa, right mm -hmm. in South Africa, Nelson Mandela and his ruling political party, the African National Congress, created a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 1995 upon coming to power, right. <laughs> and so, right. <laughs> and so th th that's that's the phrase that that was actually changed. And the, the, the cool thing about the conversation piece is that you have a history that indicates or shows the, the sort of the, the changes that are made over time. Mm -hmm. And so the public isn't privy to that. Um, I, I see that as, as the author. And so literally, you know, if if you know, if I could, and if we needed to. I could walk folks through the changes that happen. And it's really fascinating because it shows you in, in, in sort of um, incremental time how these editorial decisions and, and, and fights, you know, are managed, right, for a particular outcome. Mm -hmm. And so this was one of those fights where, you know, the editors, you know, um, you know came to me and, and essentially said, well, you know, Essentially, the ANC, the African National Congress, is an African party, um, you know, manned by or managed by by African, usually males, predominantly males. Um, you know, it's longer white rule. They're in power, right? Much like people will say Obama was in power, right? Mm -hmm. And so th 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 there, there's sort of a scandalous, you know, flirting with the idea that presence means power. That the idea that the ANC is the managers of the nation state um, in South Africa, you know, which says nothing about the conditions of the vast majority of African peoples, um, meaning indigenous African peoples, right? Not colored, not, you right. know, not not you know the six million whites that are there and their descendants. Um, and so, coming to power was really a framing that was not mine. <laughs> in fact. What I wrote originally, you know, had nothing to do with that, um, you know, and so this was was really an editorial oversight. In fact, it got it got to the point where, you know, uh, the editor that I worked with was like, "Look, you know, we'll understand it if you don't want to move forward." <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, you know, yeah. again, folks who are checking this out either live or, or later on would not really appreciate that. You know, the kinds mm -hmm. of power. Um, you know, struggles, you know, speaking of power, the kind of power dynamics that goes into crafting uh, a particular um, narrative, a point of view, uh, a story um, that you think represents, you know, the views of, 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 the, of the person who's writing, or at least who's who's tagged as author. Mm -hmm. And so this, this was one of those basic contentious points. And so I left it there because um, it wasn't worth the entirety of, of what I wanted to do, because it, it, as, as you move down, um, you actually see me. So if you see that, it's really them, right? Meaning the mm -hmm. editors. And as you move down, it says basically, you know, if you pause right there, come up a bit, please. Yeah. And so um, 
if you see the, this, ne this next passage, um, which is me, nor have any post Mandela governments put the per perpetrators of apart that on trial, right? Right. That's my right. phrase. Right. <laughs> Folks got off. <laughs> That's and right. And that was scripted. And the ANC That's negotiated right. that, right? That's right. You know, because essentially, and basically, this is my phrasing, the power structure that upheld apartheid remained largely undisturbed. This was also a fight. That's and right. so my concession was, okay, I'll keep that idea that came to power, right? But this is, you know, this is me. <laughs> First of all, I mean, just to come back to this, even even yeah. their attempt, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to overdo it here, but but even the attempt in the rewrite here, I mean, this is this is a, an entirely contradictory comment anyway, mm. because no group that comes to power is going to have a truth and reconciliation commission. You would have trials and convictions and redistribution and punishment. Uh, you wouldn't, you know, so, so, I mean, even, even in his own, you know, even Desmond Tutu wrote in his own memoir, uh, and then told us when Dr. Turner had him to the Africana center, uh, that the reason they did the TRC is because they did not have power and they did not win. When he was asked to make the comparison to world war two and the Nuremberg trials, he said, we couldn't do Nuremberg because we didn't have a victory. So, so this whole thing of coming to power, uh, in and of itself, um, so I mean, it it did stick out to me when I read it, but but I, you know the the editorial piece uh, that that you know anyway. So I anyway. Um, so so I, yeah, I have no I have no segue beyond that. <laughs> that's cool because you know one one way one way to sort of um, you know sort of close you know this portion using South Africa as an example mm -hmm. um, is precisely that you know as you know about Desmond Tutu and, and and you know and he of course he was you know lead official. Um, put in charge, at least the moral leader. <laughs> right, right, right. Put, 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 put in charge of this project. Um, so his confession, of course, confirms this, which is, and this is, again, is my structuring. So um, so I, when I talk about power, I'm talking about, you know, basically this, this thing's undisturbed, it's still intact. Um, and by the way, this is this is still heavy here, though. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, one yeah. time $3,900 yeah. payment. Uh, that, I mean... By the way, I mean, how do you come up with thirty nine hundred dollars? I mean, what is that? Like, what, is, what arbitrary? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was arbitrary because, yeah. in fact, the commission, in fact, the commission was much more generous. Mm. Uh, the commission had sort of a six year period over a period of six years. Um, these kinds of monetary and non monetary benefits, including, for example, health care. Right. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you talk about redistribution. So this was sort of a a sort of a nudge, a poke towards something that could have been substantial in terms of, for example, these communities having you know, uh, um, free health care, um, you know, schooling. Of course, we can question the kinds of curricula sure. uh, in terms of that schooling. But the point was that that's where the ANC, uh, at least the, excuse me, the, the TLC uh, commission was was hedging towards in terms of a symbolic gesture, right? But, and, and Becky closed that down because, you know, you know, he was, in fact, to your point and to um, the Desmond Tutu's um, point, was beholden to the real power holders. And right. so his, his job, like Mandela, was not to disturb, not, not to really, you know, try to do much. And so, and Becky shut it down and she said, no, we're not doing a multi-year um, payment of sorts to these folks who testified, by the way, because the key was that only those who testified could be eligible to receive this right. regulatory payment, right. which means that it cut out millions. And that's the point that I make. So what I point out then is that South Africa is, 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 is the most unequal society in the world, according to metrics of the World Bank. And that's with a grain of salt, but still, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that basically, you know, whites make up the majority of the, of the wealthy elites, uh, while half, at least half of the African indigenous population lives in poverty. And that, that's really, um, you know, a conservative number or estimate. And so, and this is my, my this is called crescendo of my point. So this is my voice, right? And, and and folks who are reading this sort of carefully would notice that there's a shift in tone, right? Mm -hmm. The tone of coming to power and the tone of putting power on trial, right? And so these are sort of the 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 outcomes of the editorial decisions that are made um, for those of us who at least uh, want to fight. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, there are folks who will acquiesce because you know they want to be published or they want to um, essentially, you know, they want to join the cast of CNN as as a guest analyst. They want to be public intellectual. None of those things are my desires, right? But and but the so flip side is also, I mean, but the, and that's true, and that happens way too often. And and the flip side, of course, is that there are those who would who who, um, 
and I go back and forth on this, depending on the, the situation, uh, uh, for good or for ill, would just walk away entirely and just say, uh, and then they, and then, and then suffer the consequences of further marginalization and silencing, uh, um, you know, within their their um, within the academic environment or journalistic uh, community or their within their careers. Um, so I mean, it's 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 anyway. I you know um, anyway. That's it. That's that was it. That was the, the only the, the flip side to that. That I always, uh, mm. you know, think just needs some recognition because there, you know a lot of people who we just end up, end up never hearing from uh, because the, you know um, whatever it is, their phrasing or their their language or their argument is just not uh, uh, you, you know. There's no editorial process that, that anyway uh, they could survive. So. But, uh, um, uh, or they might just, I don't know. I mean, anyway, anyway, it doesn't, uh, let me not just keep going because I don't want to, yeah, we'll, we have a little bit of a time issue here at least, but anyway, w yeah. um, uh, let's keep well, going. Yeah. Sure. Sorry. So, so, you know, um, you know, we can sort of scroll on to the end and then I'll, I'll wrap okay. the portion up and then we can get into some other related, you know, matters. And so, um, I hear your point, and in fact, I, I appreciate that argument because I don't dismiss that argument. Because at, at one point, I was going to consider the editor's gesture that you know I could just move on. <laughs> yeah, um, because that was the point, you know, to frustrate me to the point where that um, you know I would essentially would, would let it go. Um, but I didn't let it go, and here's why: I didn't let it go because uh, I know that there's a number of you know intelligent, thinking people, reasonable people. Um, within the African world, who's going to read this because it's in a major publication? Mm -hmm. The same reason why I publish with Oxford University Press. I publish with Duke because I know that a lot of folks, um, you know, of various you know viewpoints, um, particularly in the African world, right, and so the Black African world writ large, um, who will read a book precisely because it's published by Oxford? Who will who will give a certain bit bit of you know? open-mindedness or leeway, right? We'll give them a runway, a platform to say, hey, let me check this out, right? <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons why I do that. But, but here's what people don't know for backstory is that once I publish with those folks, um, if I don't have my rights, I usually get my rights and I, and I move on from them and I republish it with my own imprint. <laughs> right. So I know they're using me, but I'm also using them. Right, right. I know they well, have a, a, a built-in network and the like, and I know that there, there is, again, a sort of taking for granted, matter of fact, um, um, seduction <laughs> that they have with, with a certain group of scholars, readers, students, you name it, general public folks. And so this is why I went with doing the piece, because besides some of these points that were concessions, um, at least two thirds of the article is, is me. And, and, and for those that were read through it can, can see that, um, because you know what I'm attacking is the idea that basically reparations is an argument, it's a claim, it's a plea, and all pleas, you know, is, is really a form of sophisticated begging. And that begging, you know, what I'm saying is, is that that if you look at what's happening, you know, in Africa today, that Africa is on the cusp of, of this major transformation. It's a youth continent uh, in a generation within 25, you know, years in, in our lifetime. Uh, Africa will, will, will be more than half of it will be people under 25. Uh, right now, Ghana, you know, um, has 57 percent of uh, youth population. So the majority of the people there are young people. And so these young people have began to, um, in many ways, not just question, but looking at, um, you know, that's called a taking for granted neocolonial structures and forms of power, right, of economic control. And so of global order. And so these are the people that I think are the most threatening <laughs> to the sort of European white ordered rural order of sorts. And, and, and this is the Africa that I want people to be aware of. And so um, many of us, e even people that are very well learned are not really aware of this Africa. <laughs> you know, um, that for example, COVID was, was a classic, I think, you know, moment that we're still living through, but in the initial year of COVID, at a 2020 up until you know early 2021, um, March 2020 to March 2021, that some of the most you know crucial innovations were happening in the continent of Africa. You know, folks in Kenya were using, um, and so they do today, 
um, you know, the, these technologies that, that were created on the ground for folks, you know, to get testing um, using, um, you know, drones or, 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 you know, reaching the rural areas and villages, you know, with supplies, medical supplies and food and, and the like. Um, you know, Nigeria very early on was the first to sequence the sort of, you know, SARS uh, COVID-19 genome. Senegal was was making these tests, you know, for less than a dollar available. And so while folks here in the States, supposedly in the richest country in the world, supposedly, uh, were struggling to get testing, were struggling to get, you know, PPEs and the like, uh, the place where we where, where people popularly believe would have would have had a, what a massacre in terms of human life didn't happen and hasn't happened yet. And I was in Ghana in November 2020, so I was there at least in that part of West Africa to, to show folks that, you know, I was impressed by what folks were doing on the ground. So what I'm mm -hmm. so, so what I'm gesturing at is that this is the Africa that I want people aware of to say, look, you don't have to beg and plead to these powerful white institutions and governments to give you some money, right? Um, or give you a paycheck, that if you, if you connect with what's happening in Africa and the African world, um, if you want a paycheck, you can be paid in another way, right? In other words, what was lost, labor, lives, you know, um, ruined potential, societies that were ruined through the ravages of, of colonial enslavement and, and other forms of, 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 of plunder and, and pillaging, that those things in, indeed can't be regained, but, but what can be built is really looking at what people are doing within the African world and connecting with that. So that's where my pivot was in terms of ending off. Now, my pivot was much stronger in the original version, you know, but in, in, in the closing part, you know, that's where I'm hedging at, right? To say, look, you don't need to beg, you know, for a paycheck. That if you connect well, with what's going on on the ground, there, there, there is the, 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 this, this sort of, um, you know, in some cases, you know, the, the sort of radical transformation that's happening on the ground that people need to be not only aware of, but connect with and build with. Brother, the radical transformation has already taken place. I don't know if you saw the latest news reported by the good folks at CNN that Germany is going to take care of everything. <laughs> well, They're leading the way. By the way, but I, I did. In fact, that was in the article, right? I mentioned that. Uh, the massacre of the Herreros. Um, right. The but that... I'm just saying, this is like, they, they heard <laughs> you, my man. They said, they said, <laughs> Dr. Carnadu called us out. We're going to come off of $1 billion. Uh, of billion. Course, <laughs> I'm sorry? 1.3 billion US. I'm sorry, 1.3. I didn't mean to yeah. short them. 1.3 <laughs> billion. Yeah. And it's going to be great, uh, mm -hmm. except for this little group of recalcitrants, of course, that want to yeah. remind everybody mm -hmm. that, you know, that that this is unacceptable uh, mm -hmm. and it's public relations, as they point out, mm -hmm. and a sellout job by the Namibian government, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you know. Um, and of course, it doesn't mention, or or we're we're not meant to 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 see the suppressed part of the story that is going to be be delivered. Uh, I think over a thirty year period is what what the what the details were. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to ultimately mean you know very little, and of course nothing in terms of you know re repairing what was actually done. But I just wanted to make sure you were clear, Doctor <laughs> Carnado, that the good Germans of Germany. Are stepping up to take care of, uh, so we don't have to beg. You know, there's no more. Anyway, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, <laughs> well, in, indeed, because folks who haven't read the piece um, will read the piece, and they, they can timestamp it. Right? They can go back to, um, I think May 6 when it was published, and see that this is precisely what I what I pointed to. You know, uh, in 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 the article about you know Germany um, essentially hedging its public relations. Um, you know, gesture, but at the same time that the, that, that the folks in Namibia, um, you know, said, look, you know, they, they, they rejected, you know, th this particular offer and were demanding more. Now, what that more would look like, you know, I'm not sure, but certainly the other folks, in fact, there's folks in Kenya who demanded more from the British um, and the British actually um, had, had more offered, you know, offered less money. The British offered 27.6 million. Um, to 5,000 elderly survivors. And this is one of the tactics, by the way, you know, that's used. It was used in the case of Rosewood, Florida, um, where basically they find, you know, the, 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 the oldest living descendant, right? Which is a few people, a handful of people um, in relative terms um, to offer this particular, you know, gesture. Um, 
but those kinds of, 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 of pleas and, and gestures, what I'm saying is that, you know, if reparations is to be used in any, in any meaningful way, it has to be used as a cover, as a smoke screen, you know, for something else. Um, it can't be for the paycheck. Uh, it can't be for renegotiating a larger paycheck because we're still in the same framework of being paid off. I mean, it is a blood money, literally and, and metaphorically, right? Um, and so you can't bring back those lives. You can't bring back their productivity. You can't bring back what they would have meant you know, to their own communities and their families. You can't suddenly bring back um, sort of the potential, right? And this is this is my point about how, what people don't appreciate about um, transoceanic slavery, whether it's Indian Ocean, Atlantic, Mediterranean, and other forms, is that um, what Africa lost was not simply people, right? Um, if anyone reads, you know, as I do, some of the some of the earliest, you know, European travel accounts, 16th century, 17th century. These Europeans were woolly and broadly impressed. The main, these cities, for example, in, in, in the Congo, um, in Benin City, you know, um, had 20, 30,000 people, were more sophisticated than London in the same period. So for example, you know, world historians um, will talk about the great divergence, right? Which, it, which, it, which basically is a tussle between the two extremes of Eurasia. Europe on the one side, which is a peninsula and on the continent, and China on the other, right? And the great divergence is basically how Europe surpassed China, right, to become a world power. That, that, that's a, that's the storyline, but that's not really the real story. The great divergence is, is is what didn't happen to Africa because of Eurasian intrusion. In other words, if Africa were left alone, this is a it's a counter, you know, um, factual. Um, the the rate of quote unquote development uh, that were happening on the ground, according to the European travel accounts themselves. You know, it was, was mind blowing, um, you know, and, and these are both, you know, um, coastal societies as well as interior society. In fact, most Africans were not on the coast. They were in the interior. The most sophisticated, you know, um, urban settlements, you know, developed settlements with um, continental trade systems. Right. And this is another backstory is that Africans became colonized once they were upended out of their own economies. So, for example, in the case of Ghana, where I study, it was only in the early 20th century when the British introduced and forced people to use paper and then coin current, coin and then paper currency. People rejected it. They were still using gold dust. It's only when the British essentially, um, you know, uh, conquered the Asante Empire and then at the, at the last sovereign African Empire, and then essentially, you know, forced people to use the cash currency and basically incorporate it into the European cash economy, and then gold dust became worthless. Basically now people's store of value in their own currency, they're now in debt. And I'm sure you can relate to this in terms of your black buying power, you know, thesis. And so, or just, or <laughs> just my own personal debt. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Now let's make it, make it more so plain. That story <laughs> happens over the entirety yeah. of Africa. Yeah. In fact, Ghana is one of the few countries that come out, out of political independence in quotation out of debt. That's right. Ghana emerges, you know, its currency, which is actually the Ghana pound before it becomes the CD, emerged in 1957 at a one to one correspondent with the pound sterling. Most African territories that, were, that came out of, you know, so called independence were in debt. And that's really the undertold story, you know, that I think, you know, thinking about reparations and, and essentially connecting with African history, connecting with, you know, African transformations, African. Um, you know, dream deferred uh, or what have you allows us to appreciate it, what sovereignty and what freedom would have looked like, mm -hmm. right? You can't be sovereign uh, if, you, if you're upended out of your own currency and your store of value, right? And so if reparations is about a paycheck, you can't be free in other person's currency. <laughs> you mm -hmm. just can't, you know, whatever the exchange rate. <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, well, that's always part of of the imperial process impose your currency on other people. That's, that's the, that's what the, 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 the British did in Kenya. That's what, I mean, that's what everybody does. I mean, it's, it's, it's what was done here in, in what became the United States to the indigenous people, the greenback and all that. I mean, you force the, the, and, and that's part of the whole, any, you know, uh, um, Anyway, before we get to, to, unfortunately, we have to wrap this up. I wanted to, to to just sort of check with you. Are you are you able to hang out beyond uh, for for our, our next 
conversation or or story? Well, I, I got to run at nine, but if you have okay. uh, I'll, I'll certainly. Um, I mean, you could always come back. I just I was just checking how long you wanted to hang out today. I mean, that's yeah. all. Uh, well, uh, today I got to run at nine. Okay, uh, that's cool. Things, but but um, yeah, I mean, if you have me back on, I, I'll certainly would enjoy yeah, it um, whenever. <laughs> because it, it, there's, there is um, you know, lots more. Um, and I hope the folks who are joining us live or who will join us later um at least gets a gets gets a sense of again the the backstory that forms the presentation that we get in whatever media um you know landscape whether it's visual auditory or print right is that th there is this crucial uh at least for those of us who want to fight right? mm -hmm. <laughs> as you say some of us just say hey it's not worth the fight and mm -hmm. and look i get that um uh, because I, I was there uh, and by the way, this was my first sort of mainstream media piece, by the way. Right, so right, right. The learning experience, you know, for me. Um, and I plan to do a little bit more of this, but this experience, you know, certainly has has uh, prepared me in terms of how I'm going to go into the next tussle, to the next fight. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I think there is a mediated value, you know, to um, these views. And, and again, you're a published author, so you know this. I'm sure Palgrave, you know, um, you know, gave you certain room, but also I'm sure that in certain constraints. Um, they, well, I constrained myself with that mm -hmm. book because I wanted I, I really tried to suppress any kind of ideological <laughs> arguments as best I could because I wanted people just to focus on buying power. Exactly. But I definitely understand your point. And and I, I'll just share quickly. I keep bringing this up, man. But but to me, it exemplifies so much of what you're saying. Um, and it was such a funny boomerang for me. So that when, you know, when 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 Peniel Joseph published his book, Stokely, and uh, uh, and I wrote a critical essay of that book, I probably I think the essay is pretty daggone good. And if I had pushed it through another couple of levels of peer review, because uh, some friends did look at it in terms of peer real friends, but in terms of an actual peer review process and got try to get it published in maybe a more major journal, I think it could have gotten there. The 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 problem, but I made it, but I was at that time making a conscious choice. I don't want to do that. I want to put this on my website and be free to say what I want, how I want to say it and lay out the argument. But the flip side is by not trying to get the, 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 what is it? The imprimatur of a major print uh, or publication or even, you know, black studies blog uh, when, when when his name came back up and I was, I keep bringing this up and I don't with Aaron Mate and Mate interviews him and I reach out to Aaron. And I'm like, this dude is a problem. You should, again, it's like if, if I interviewed Rachel Maddow about Russiagate, um, his response was to throw up to me a screenshot of Gerald Horn's blurb of, of Peniel's book and mm -hmm. to say, well, if Horn, if he's got the backing of Horn, he didn't say it this way, but he's essentially saying, well, who was Jared and his little, I mix what I like dot org blog. Uh -huh. And so, so my point is the, the, I wanted to stay quote unquote pure mm -hmm. and not go through some sort of silly prolonged process and have to have arguments like these, which I have had with a number of different academic journals over the years and go through the stress and the drama and all of that. I didn't want to go through all of that. But the flip side is I didn't have the backing of some sort of legitimate, you know, legitimating publication and it, it it so these are it's it, and it weakened my it, it, in that instance and probably some others weakened my argument or weakened the effect or reach of my argument so it's just something that i think people it's this it's this i don't know contradiction that we keep having to struggle with um so i i just appreciate mostly that that really i just appreciate that we had this platform that you we had the relationship where you could say my man <laughs> Let's talk about what really happened there, uh, you know, and I and, and that we could have this discussion, which I think is not only of, of, of interest and value to me, but I think to, to our audience and those who will see this later. So anyway, all that to say, man, I appreciate you. And anytime you're ready to come back and want to come back. And I have been continuing to read your book and we got to revisit your Kwame and Krumah stuff, too. Sure thing. We, we, we can do all that. We can yeah, do yeah. All that. So all that's coming. So anyway, Dr. Conan, do I really appreciate you, man. Uh, it, uh, well, peace man. to you, man. We'll catch you soon. Sure thing. Appreciate it. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.